Uh, I've got some good news for you. I think we can over deliver on our, uh, uh, on our panel title. It says the military and why San Antonio became the Air Force capital of the United States. Well, I think now we're going to expand that a little bit more and John's paper will also look at a more joint perspective, uh, not just the Air Force. So I think that's great, great news. Uh, I am uh, uh, Professor Edward B. Westerman. I'm a history professor at the Texas A&M University of San Antonio, and I'm also a retired Air Force veteran, so I'm really happy uh, to uh, be able to introduce our speakers uh, as we talk about, last but not least, certainly the role of the military in San Antonio. Uh, our first speaker will be John Manguso, who was born in Brooklyn. His family moved to Florida when he was eight. He graduated from the University of Florida with his BA and a commission in the Army in 1967. He served eight years on active duty, including a tour in Vietnam. He got his Master's of Arts degree from the University of Florida in 1977. He served as director of the Fort Sam Houston Museum for 33 years. Concurrently, he served in the Army Reserve as a historian and an arts, monuments, and archives officer. He has written four books on the armed forces in San Antonio. Our second speaker today is Gary W. Boyd who was the Director, History and Museums Program, Air Education and Training Command, Randolph Air Force Base, Texas. He provides guidance to the subordinate unit historians and heritage and museum personnel throughout the command and manages the AETC Museum Program and Air Force Art Holdings on loan in the command. Mr. Boyd has worked as a historian at all levels of command, serving the Air Force historian as career program administrator, U.S. Air Force History and Museums at Headquarters Air Force Personnel Command prior to his assignment to Headquarters AETC. He served as an Air Force historian both on active duty and a civilian for more than 30 years. So if you would please join me in welcoming our panelists. Good afternoon members of the Iron Brigade. Uh, good news, we just talked to Mary Margaret and she says you all will not have to take the written test at the end of the session. Uh, my presentation is entitled uh, Military City San Antonio Accretion Theory. Accretion is, it's how a pearl is formed inside an oyster. You get an, ir an irritant or a cause and the organism responds and coats it with something to address the irritation. And eventually you end up with a pearl. Another thing you have to understand is adaptive reuse. Uh, that's a familiar term for us historic preservationists. That's where you build a warehouse and after it falls into disuse, a developer comes in and converts it to expensive lofts for people to live in. Both of those apply to the military in San Antonio. You all know that we've got four active military bases and two were closed, but there's still major military activities at the closed bases as well. And we also have a plethora of military sites, many of which hardly anybody in San Antonio is aware of their existence. And there's an awful lot of military people in San Antonio. These are the, uh, let's see, we'll try this laser thingy. We got Kelly and Lachlan down here. We have Brooks and uh, Stinson Field, Fort Sam Houston, Ran Randolph, yeah. uh, Alamo Field, if you've been to the airport, you know about that. And up here, the dark part is Camp Bullis. In both of these, light colored areas are extensions of land which was rented during the first and or second world war and part of Camp Bullis leased area extends above the top of the graphic. So that's what most people know about. Okay. This is the number of people that are uh, military related in San Antonio. Uh, 34 percent I would like to take a survey of this group here. If you fall into any of those categories, hold up your hand while I take a head count. Looks like more than 34%. Good. 
Uh, this is the amount of money that the Department of Defense shoves into San Antonio. And what are the factors? You know, why, why is this a military city? Well, location, location, location. And if you have attended any of the seminars during this tricentennial event, it starts off with water and the San Antonio River. Uh, got a lot of water, arable land, you grow crops, uh, you can feed your own population, and you can farm stuff and sell it to the Army, bring in more money. Central location, uh, the borders that the Army was worried about were the Rio Grande and the Indian frontier out to the northwest. And San Antonio was perfectly situated to affect both of them. And we have fairly good climate. A quotation about why it's a central location and a, a great place for a military site. If you attended Bruce Winder's presentation the other day, he talked about population center, water supply, economic impact, strategic location, garrison. San Antonio will have all of those. We're going to go, I'm going to go through a whole bunch of sites that were military sites in San Antonio. Do not try to copy the whole list. If you want a copy of all of them, uh, you know, let me know, I'll send you a copy. If you find the out that I missed one of them, let me know so I can amend the list. That's one of the good things about coming to this kind of a session. Uh, on the third session I came to, somebody pointed out a military facility I'd never heard of. So the change isn't incorporated into this slide yet. But these are the Spanish, some of the Spanish and Mexican sites. Some more of those. Texas Revolution, a lot of battles, a lot of military activity in and around San Antonio. Battle of the Alamo is not just, you know, there in that the chapel on, May, on Alamo Plaza, it was a very big battlefield. More Republic of Texas with the several invasions. And then the War of the Rebellion and Reconstruction. Pay no attention to that slide, Gary's gonna cover that. <laughs> when do we start? In 1845, we start having U.S. military locations, beginning with the Army moving into town and setting up a supply depot in the Alamo. They later add a headquarters and a garrison. And 1855, the arsenal. That's where HEB is now, the headquarters. More U.S. military locations. More U.S. military locations. More military locations. Here's some that you wouldn't have realized were military locations. Uh, like the Gilbo House. General EOC Ord had his daughter married in that house. Uh, recruiting stations, there's 17 of them. Let's see. Nine Mile Hill and Eleven Mile Hill. If you're hiking out to Camp Bullis with the Army, you probably stopped at one of those for an overnight. The Fink Cigar Factory no longer with us. During the First World War, the Army's activities expanded so much that they couldn't contain the supply requirements on Fort Sam. They leased over 600,000 square feet of warehouse space in San Antonio usually right along the rail lines. Did you know the, the Hayes Street Bridge was a military installation at one time? Now it's a brewery. That's perfect adaptive reuse. <laughs> There's what uh, it looks like on the map, adding red spots for uh, many of the sites. The big cluster over there just to the 
east of uh, downtown is a lot of the warehouses that the army was leasing. And a close up of the downtown area. The big circle is, encompasses most of the battlefield of the Alamo, but there are other locations. That's a, let's see, that's a, a whole bunch of warehouses out here. And amazingly, a lot of these locations still exist. If you go to the train station, the Amtrak station, across the street from it, there's that building with the large monster thing next to it. That building was an army warehouse during the First World War. And so was the San Antonio Macaroni Company. This is the insignia of some of the units that have actually been stationed here. Uh, if you want to know all the units that have trained here, there's a whole lot more than that. San Antonio military alumni. Presidents, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, admirals, all on down. There's a cultural impact between San Antonio and the military. There's a lot of alumni who have contributed to the military presence and also a lot of military people who have a presence in San Antonio afterwards. Like uh, Porfirio Salinas, that was his painting in the big room where I had lunch. Uh, he was a private in the army here at Fort Sam. At Lee Ayers, he convinced the army to use colonial revival architect, Spanish colonial revival architecture here at Kelly, Brooks, Randolph, Fort Sill, and Fort Bliss, besides doing other uh, buildings in San Antonio. Sports, you know, this is a sports town. We have a lot of roads named for military people. Some of them, some of these people you didn't know were famous military people. But I consider all these military named highways through San Antonio as the sinews that bind the town together. More military themed roads. Cultural impact. San Antonio was referred to as one of the heavens that people in the army turned to. It's also San Antonio's army post. The second division I was here is San Antonio's own. Maury Maverick called San Antonio the mother-in-law of the army and I guess also the Air Force. And Blackland is a gateway to the Air Force. So there's strong connections. Businesses, USAA was started by military people to ensure military people. And now it's one of our bigger businesses. Alamo Iron Works, did you know they made hand grenades during the First World War? Pioneer flour mills provided flour to the troops that were here in 1911 for the maneuver camp. Uh, movies, Wings, Big Parade, Soldiers in White, two Rough Rider movies, the North and South miniseries was filmed partly at Fort Sam, uh, West Point of the Air, and I Wanted Wings for the, the flying people. And look at all the entertainers. Chuck Norris, all right, an Air Force guy. And parades, the military has always been a big participant in the parades, and for years and years, we had an army duchess in the parade. She lived in the Silwell House with her dad at Fort Sam. Well, we got a lot of schools named for military people, and that's only a partial list. Now, how did we get this way? Do you remember the TV show Connections? British guy comes on and says, in 1607, a couple of monks in Bavaria invented champagne or something. And then he says, well, that led to, and that led to, and by the time the show's over, the United States is landing on the moon because of the monks in Bavaria. <laughs> That's how it happened for the military in San Antonio. Okay, San Antonio River attracts the Native Americans, city builds up. When the Padres are coming here, you gotta go where the potential converts are, so 
That's where the Padres come. They need to be protected, so the Spanish and then Mexican army moves in there as well. A town grows up. It becomes San Antonio Bejar. It's uh, an important, as Bruce said, it's an important place. So when Texas is becoming a state, the U.S. Army moves in and establishes the post at San Antonio with the headquarters of Garrison Depot and an arsenal. As the situation on the frontier changes, and you don't need army posts out in the middle of West Texas, they start concentrating troops, and where are you gonna put them? In a central location. Where's the central location? San Antonio. So they construct the infantry post at Fort Sam Houston, making it the second, second largest army post in the country. Spanish-American War, the army expands again. Where are you gonna put them? Fort Sam Houston. They established the cavalry and light artillery post, making it the largest post in the country. Since you can't have people firing cannons in the city limits, they started buying land out on Leon Springs to fire the artillery and other weapons. So at that point, San Antonio, Fort Sam is a brigade post. So you got the additional training areas. In 1911, where are you gonna put troops in a, a big troop exercise? San Antonio. They lease some land between uh, what's the gift chapel on Fort Sam now and where Brook General Hospital is built later. They release all that and they have a maneuver camp there. When uh, the situation on the border boils over, Pancho Villa crosses, they mobilize the army, they build a tent camp in that space. World War I breaks out, they build a mobilization cantonment in the same land and the army buys that and enough land to extend Fort Sam Houston temporarily all the way out to Kirby. After the war, what are you gonna do with the troops coming home? Well, you got all this at Fort Sam, so they put the second division at Camp Travis, only post in the country with a division of troops. And, but they're in temporary buildings, so in 1926-28, the Congress passes the Army Housing Program and they replace all the temporary buildings with the Spanish Colonial Revival buildings. Uh, more than 400 building, permanent buildings put up at that time. Then we get World War II and troops are passing through Fort Sam Houston like crazy, uh, but they don't expand Camp Bolas enough, so after the war, you can't put that in infantry division back at Fort Sam. Too much firepower. What are you gonna do? What does the Army do that doesn't require a lot of weapons? Medical training. So they start moving the Medical Field Service School into the area of the new post. And later they move the enlisted medical training here. And we've also got one of the largest hospitals in the Army at Brook General Hospital, and that becomes Brook Army Medical Center. So you have the Medical Field Service School, the Medical Training Center, Brook Army Medical Center, where you become called the Home of Army Medicine and the Health Services Command. Well, we got a, an expanding patient base, so we need a new hospital. So they build new Bamsey out across uh, the uh, railroad tracks. And that becomes new Bamsey, or some people say Samsey, but to us old timers, it's Bamsey. And they move out of the old general hospital building. So when the United States moves out of Panama, you've got the headquarters down there. They move temporarily to Miami, and then they move here into the old hospital building. And then Brack comes along. And although you know, the Air Force took a couple of hits on that, Fort Sam Houston acquired $3 billion worth of construction, new construction, and a whole lot more historic building renovation. And 14,000 more people. They moved all the, all the services and enlisted medical training to Fort Sam Houston to take advantage of the medical facilities and to graft that onto the Army Medical Department Center and School, which is the evolved member of the Medical Field Service School. And then the Insulation Management Command moves from uh, the East Coast into what had been one of the new post 
the Army Housing Program barracks. And they move into that building. And they come up with a, a command that's on the East Coast, the M Mission and Insulation Contracting Command. And they move into the long barracks on the infantry post, which had been abandoned since about 1990. And all the medical training activities are rolled into a, a thing called the Military Education and Training Campus, which does all the enlisted training for all the services, and it also does all the officer medical training for the Army. And they, they are in the area that was occupied by the new post, which is on the site of Camp Travis. And you stir that all together, and you've got Military City USA. That's a Gary. Don't look at that. <laughs> uh, what are your questions, if any? Yes, ma'am. Yes. yes. It was uh, some kind of a a warehouse for I think it was medical supplies. I, I imagine so. If, if I could go ahead and intervene, if we let's go ahead and hold the questions till after the presentations because they might connect and you might have a question that uh, kind of crosses over both directions. So uh, thank you. Hey, hello, I'm uh, Gary Boyd from Air Education and Training Command, and I'm glad to be here. Uh, a lot of public historians in, uh, in JDSA and San Antonio. Uh, you know, we have a historian, we have four at Air Education and Training Command, one at the 59th Medical Wing. We have one at the Air Force Installation Management Headquarters. Uh, we have one at AFPC and one that does uh, the field work for the Air Force History Program, which is where I came from before I went to, to AETC. We have one at the fly, uh, 12th Flying Training Wing, one at the 37th uh, uh, Training Wing at Lackland, one at the 502nd Air Base Wing, and one at the 149th Fighter Wing. So historians are well represented too, and uh, I think you can tell just by that little list of, of major organizations how important the Air Force is to San Antonio. Uh, the Air Force has helped San Antonio over the years weather a couple of depressions, some recessions, and some uh, uh, mass exoduses from other cities and states to San Antonio. And in fact, one of the great crises facing the Air Force today, especially around Randolph, is the influx of people. We've had almost 100,000 people surround Randolph just in the last six years since I moved to San Antonio. So the, uh, the question is, are we going to be able to maintain enough free air corridors and airspace in order to continue to do our mission. So the threat that uh, uh, is somewhat existential for the Air Force, we help create by, uh, I think, help bolstering San Antonio over the years. So I'll begin my little talk with, uh, and I have no slides, and that's probably a good thing. I was at Vandenberg uh, this week at, uh, at Space Launch Center 6, looking at the heavy launch facility there. It's a part of AEDC and a part of the reach of Air Education and Training Command out of San Antonio worldwide. And uh, it, it was an amazing uh, display. They're about to launch a Delta IV rocket with a classified payload, but uh, SpaceX is one of the, uh, the neighbors at Vandenberg. And I had to think that uh, the modern path of the Air Force was charted here in San Antonio from really very humble origins. Uh, there are a lot of people who are experts in various aspects of Air Force history from uh, George Kelly. Uh, in fact, I would, I'll throw uh, questions about early, early aviation in San Antonio to uh, John Manguso because he's, he's an expert at it. I brought with me an expert in space history and uh, the School of Aerospace Medicine, Brooks, and the early air bases in San Antonio, Mr. Rudy Purificado, who is our curator at AATC and just a great uh, comrade and compatriot. Uh, he's one of the finest people that I know, and he'll help answer your questions as well. But uh, 
The slide of James Burke, The Connections, is probably the, the best slide you could have. Why San Antonio? Well, uh, let me just start with what's called the gravity penalty. When an airman takes off, he's got to land. And theoretically, that landing should be a safe one. Or, you know, there may be an airbase name for you, say a Kelly, a Randolph, a Brooks. And so the earliest days of the Air Force were, were really transformed by the first accident in the history of air power, which was when Thomas Selfridge was killed with the, uh, during the Wright Flyer uh, uh, exhibition and uh, uh, sales pitch at Fort Myers in 1908. If Thomas Selfridge had lived, San Antonio may not have been the, the hub of aviation in American history. If the Alamo hadn't fallen and if Fort Sam, all of these related incidents make San Antonio the air capital of the world, but uh, one little thing could have gone wrong and it wouldn't have happened. Selfridge uh, is lesser known Air Force figure and he should be better known. Uh, I think when I, I look at Air Force history, we, we look at ourselves as a relatively recent uh, service. Uh, we're the baby, you know. The Army treats us as if we're going to be taken back into their custody at any given time. But the history of air power uh, tends to revolve around the, the Wright brothers in 1903 and not around Hammondsport, New York, and Glenn Curtis. And the reason for that was the uh, Wright brothers wanted to monetize their invention, and they wanted to, I think, minimize the roles of others in their invention and were almost manic in their need to uh, turn their invention into a profit, whereas Curtis, uh, Samuel Langley, and some of the other innovators who helped the, the Wright brothers uh, prior to 1903 uh, have been kind of cast aside in the historiography of the Air Force. Selfridge is one of those characters. He asked the Wrights if he could help them and learn as part of the, uh, an Army Extension Program, basically a, as a sabbatical force to uh, the Wrights. And they were so jealous of their invention that they said no. Uh, Glenn Curtis and Hammondsport said, come on, well, we, we're, we're trying to learn on the fly. And Selfridge becomes one of the great geniuses in Air Force history. He's the first aeronautical engineer that was, wore a uniform. He's the first Air Force historian. He wrote uh, the, uh, the notes for the Aeronautical Experiment Association there in Hammondsport. And he designed the first aircraft in Air Force history. Uh, it was called the Red Wing. He was called back to the Pentagon, or what would have been the Pentagon uh, in the early days. He was called back to DC to work with the Signal Corps, and so he didn't get to fly it. But he, he was the first person to fly in Air Force history. He flew the White Wing, which was a derivative of the Red Wing, which crashed when he was missing. And so Selfridge was the most knowledgeable airman in the Air Force at a time when the, uh, uh, the, the early flights, the pioneers of aviation, were, were taking wing. His death in the Wright Flyer is highly ironic because the Wrights had prevented him from studying with them. And he was probably almost as knowledgeable or more knowledgeable than the Wrights themselves on air, aircraft. And uh, his great contribution to uh, air, uh, nautical engineering was uh, the thrust potential of propellers, and it was a propeller that killed him. So there's a lot of irony there. Had Selfridge lived, who knows where the first real hub of the aviation would have been, but he was replaced by Ben Folloy, and Ben Folloy is the character which creates San Antonio as the air capital of the world and the nexus of the world for air power. Uh, as is well known, Folloy relocates to Fort Sam, and by March of 1910, with some correspondence with the Wright brothers, he flies, builds, and solos in the Wright Flyer A, and the rest is history. From 1910 to the present day, San Antonio is the air capital of the United States, even when it's displaced temporarily by other locations, uh, say Montgomery, Alabama, or Savannah, Georgia, or Hammondsport, New York. It all rotates back eventually to Fort Sam, and uh, when uh, George Kelly was killed, in a, ironically, in a Curtis airplane. Uh, they were banned from Fort Sam, and uh, as a matter of fact, John Manguso has a tremendous slideshow on with pictures I'd never seen before of Kelly's flight. 
but uh, they were given uh, basically a Babylonian exile. And by, uh, from 1911 to 1915, there's less and less aviation in San Antonio, but when they returned to Dodd Field and the expedi expeditionary force that winds up uh, trying to track Pancho Villa across the border, the first aero squadron is created in San Antonio. And as, and as a matter of fact, the first aero squadron's pennant and banner is in, on display at uh, the museum in the quadrangle at Fort Sam Houston. And we have a, the second copy of it uh, at our museum on Lackland that uh, Rudy is our uh, curator for. So from 1915 on, there's a continuous uh, presence in San Antonio. Uh, and again, it could have ended there. There's no reason for San Antonio to be a, a feature of Air Force except that uh, Ben Folloy seemed to really love the city. He loved interacting with the city. He called it a wild west town, and it really was. Uh, there was a speaker at, the, uh, uh, at one of the uh, other seminars just a few minutes ago talking about the growth of San Antonio, but the, really the, the culminating event, that uh, kind of catalyzing event that created an Air Force presence forever in San Antonio and a San Antonio presence forever in the Air Force was World War I. The uh, Chamber of Commerce, uh, and I'll give Senator uh, uh, Morris Shepard uh, a shout out here, created a really innovative way of financing a, uh, a lease of a, a lot of land on the southwestern or southeastern part of the town that became Kelly Air Force Base. Uh, when the military appropriation for World War I was levied, it wasn't, it wasn't allowed for uh, the purchase of land initially. So they had to go back to Washington, D.C. and ask for a change in legislation which allowed a more permanent presence. And then the genius of San Antonio is that not only was Kelly uh, appropriated, but it, when it became clear that it wasn't large enough to do uh, the, the centralized training mission, they created what became Kelly Air Force Base Number 2, Kelly Field Number 2, which had 24 hangars as opposed to 12, and another, uh, I, I think, uh, 26,000 acres altogether for that uh, military reservation. So Kelly becomes uh, the hub of air power in World War I. It becomes a hub of uh, all air activities at that point. Uh, Kelly Field Number 5 becomes Brooks Field. Uh, Sidney Brooks is killed in an uh, air accident, is the first one in training to die, and he has an airfield named in his honor. And uh, from then on, it becomes uh, more or less a, a domino going downhill where more and more air activities happen in this, this region. Uh, the Billy Mitchell trial, Billy Mitchell, of course, was uh, legendary and synonymous with Fort Sam, and that's another terrific question to ask John Langusa because his trial was held while he was proximate to San Antonio. But the, the great fallout from, from Mitchell's uh, court-martial is the Air Power Act of 1926. And the Air Power Act of 1926 creates within its uh, empowering act the creation of what was going to be called the West Point of the Air, Randolph Field. And Randolph Field is and still is the, the jewel of the Air Force. It becomes the, uh, I would consider it the gravitational point of everything else in the Air Force. It, uh, it, it is also built with innovative and creative means. Uh, there's uh, a Burgoyne master's thesis, which I have on the table over there, on just the formulation of and the acquisition of the land that became Randolph Field. It was quite interesting, quite novel, and maybe not legal the way they sold the original certificates to allow for the purchase of the land because the land was financed with using taxes that had not been collected. And so they levied certificates to buy the, the land based on revenue they might collect or might not collect. But it was allowed to happen. The purchase took place on the last day of of uh, the year 1927, just in time before the expiration of the Air Power Act, and other cities would have become, uh, uh, because they had not the same restrictions that San Antonio did. There, there were literally dozens and dozens of towns and cities across the United States that were uh, trying to become the next West Point of the Air. Think of the Amazon headquarters fight of recent times. It was that way. The Air Force's preference would have been to locate it in San Antonio because San Antonio had proven to be a great location for flying, uh, had great civic involvement, 
and was a great place to live. And it, it was an inducement to, uh, to flyers to come and live and stay in this area. And it remains that to this day. But because of the creative financing, Randolph was created. And right before the Great Depression, the, uh, the greatest American uh, construction project since the Panama Canal was opened just uh, a little southwest of Schertz, Texas. And that is uh, one of the great architectural phenomena of uh, the Corps of Engineers of all time. And as uh, John Manguso mentioned, Atlee's helped construct and design some of the, the, the tremendous architecture on Randolph. And something that's not really very well known and very well appreciated, uh, there's the uh, administrative building at uh, Randolph, which is called the Taj, is one of the great Art Deco buildings of the early 1930s. It may be one of the greatest buildings west of the, the Mississippi. And yes, it was in Spanish colonial style, but it had uh, Moorish influenced uh, uh, Rees relief uh, uh, cement uh, uh, applications to the central water tower, which was inside. Uh, it was covered by this beautiful encasement of Art Deco embellishments and Moorish tiles. It's beautiful to look at, and it was completely utilitarian. Randolph was supposed to be Air City USA, so it was built in concentric circles, and all of the uh, utilities were placed underground, water, electricity. It was really the future of the Air Force. It was the future of the United States. And uh, the beautiful uh, Taj Mahal to this day is still the feature, central feature of the Air Force and the Air Force's history. And it's here in San Antonio. And uh, there's a great picture of Veronica Lake in, uh, from uh, the 1931, 1932 era uh, on top of the Taj. And uh, to this day, we still offer tours up there. So I want to try and encourage you, if you get a chance to go to Randolph, take a look at the Taj and just enjoy and take it in. Uh, because it was at the height of the Depression, they wanted to spend every dime and then a few more if they could get them. And so every embellishment that they could put into that uh, $250,000 building is there, I guarantee you. There's even subway tiles in the, the bathrooms. It's quite amazing. And for its time, it kept people employed, and it kept uh, San Antonio, uh, I think, a vibrant city. And uh, the, the building of Randolph had, did much to, I think, mitigate some of the, the effects of the Depression, at least locally. Uh, compared to the Dust Bowl that surrounded uh, San Antonio and permeated the Midwest where I'm from, Kansas, uh, San Antonio was spared some of the worst uh, of the uh, Depression based on the expenditures of the government. And to this day, I think uh, the, the government and the Air Force helps mitigate some of the financial downturns that happen in this country. We have billions and billions of dollars that we spend every year. And I think I saw somewhere that there are $40 billion worth of construction projects in the books over the near term. So you look at it, we, there, there are air installations throughout San Antonio because of the weather, but mostly because Floyd loved the area and kind of kept the ball rolling. Uh, Brooksfield becomes a central hub for a school of aviation medicine, which was a, a new science. Uh, you know, we were losing pilots due to preventable diseases, and a lot of pilots were not really qualified to be pilots, but were allowed to fly in the World War I period. But by the 1920s, we started to, started to systematize what we did and what it took to be a pilot. And that all became part of San Antonio's history. The School of Aviation Medicine at Brooks, it moved to Randolph when Randolph was, was built, and it moved back again. And uh, of course, we talk about uh, the medical hub of uh, San Antonio. So the Army is working on making San Antonio the crown jewel of the Army's health system. At the same time, there's a, a little installation just south of Leon Creek on, on Kelly Field that becomes the San Antonio Aviation Cadet Center. And that was called Sad Sac, uh, Sac C, and a couple of other less than, than great names. But in 1942, Every aviation cadet was classified and underwent its initial training in what became Lackland Air Force Base. There's a tremendous picture that I think does more to tell the story of World War II than any other. And it's, uh, it's unfortunately, it's copyrighted. It's Hap Arnold in front of what he calls 10 acres of cadets. And uh, at the San Antonio Aviation Cadet Center, there's 100,000 airmen standing shoulder to shoulder listening to him talk about the future of air power in December of 1942. And 
that picture, if you can imagine if you were Mussolini or Hitler or Hirohito, Stalin, would have been given you pause. 100,000 airmen who are in initial training, almost every one of those airmen in that field wound up flying over Europe or the Pacific and helped do more than any, almost any other branch to win World War II. I'm an airman, so I'm gonna say probably more than any other branch, and I'll let Manguso argue that one later. But uh, that, that, that picture uh, and, and this, the wry smile that Arnold has says more about San Antonio and the growth of the Air Force than I think anything else. And of course, after the war, the San Antonio Aviation Cadet Com, uh, Center uh, becomes Lackland Air Force Base. It becomes the center of Air Force basic training. Uh, so San Antonio becomes the real gateway to the Air Force. Thousands and thousands and thousands of airmen start to, to uh, come through San Antonio as their first stop from 1946 on. By 1950, in the advent of the Korean War, there were 90,000 uh, airmen in training, in all stages of training on Lackland. And it's crazy, there are tent cities, uh, other bases start to take the overflow, Samson in, in New York, uh, Parks in California, Shepherd up in North Texas. But eventually by 56, 57, all of uh, Air Force basic training is coalesced fairly uh, steadily to Lackland, with one exception, Amarillo did take an overflow during the meningitis ep uh, epidemic in 66. But Lackland has been the first step and first stop of every airman since uh, the 40s. And uh, if you think about it, every one of America's wars uh, was won with a combination, a joint force that relied heavily on air power, and all that air power started in San Antonio. Uh, something that my previous boss, uh, General Robertson, used to like to say was air power starts here. And it was so true. Uh, everything that the Air Force became really uh, coalesced out of and morphed out of San Antonio. And uh, it has, over the years, gotten m stronger and stronger. Wilford Hall Medical Center was formed to help take the enormous amount of, of traffic coming through basic training and became a great hub of air, uh, air evac. Uh, when I started in the Air Force, I was an air evac technician, and we would send, we'd find a way to, find, uh, to send patients to Wilford Hall Medical Center and it was the great uh, hub of Air Force medicine. Uh, the logistics center that Kelly started in 1918 and became really Kelly Air Logistics Center that was, has for survived the BRAC and has become part of the Port San Antonio. Uh, there was logistics, there was medicine, there was flight training, there was basic training, and then there was construction, and then there were all the other odd we call them Air Force skill codes, AFSCs, that trained or, or were technically trained here in San Antonio. And so the legacy of, of, of this city and is one of a complete kinship with the Air Force. Uh, a lot of times we, we, uh, we date the Air Force only to 1947. Well, that's really not true. The, the reality is it, it dates back probably to Selfridge and his, his original notes there in Hammondsport and into 1907 with the formulation of the Aeronautical Division of the Signal Corps. But throughout it, interwoven with the history and the great airmen of all time, the Doolittle Raiders, Curtis LeMay, Charles Lindbergh, and his dog Booster. <laughs> These are all people and airmen and great Americans who are associated with and forever part of San Antonio. And I thank you. Okay, it appears we have about 15 minutes left for questions, uh, so uh, let's go ahead and start in front. We'll move that direction. Someone uh, mentioned Hondo. My father went through pilot training in Hondo, and then would come. They would come into the Gunther on weekends for uh, I don't know what they did, you know. <laughs> uh, I, I had a little section, and I didn't talk about it, but I, I should have. You know, there are today 11 great military installations within San Antonio, and John alluded to a little bit of that. 46,000 acres of, of military reservations just in this area. Hondo, just a little bit of a drive on, on, on 90. In fact, I talked to them a few years ago. Uh, a great World War II and, and post-World War II and an impossible location for training even to this day because the airfield still exists. But uh, there were dozens of these little uh, auxiliary fields uh, 
Clear Springs, there was Cade, there uh, were uh, tiny little fields that no longer exist except with wrought iron posts like Davenport as you're driving there by the Rolling Oaks Mall. These were little tiny auxiliary fields that uh, airmen from Kelly, Randolph, and Brooks would go to on part of their overland navigational trips and Hondo grew from that. And of course, because San Antonio is the, the great center and, the, and here I am as the AETC historian and I didn't take credit for this, but AETC moved back. It had its own Babylonian exile from 1946 to 1957. It was at Barksdale and then at Scott. But when Air Education and Training Command, and at that point it was called Air Training Command, removes itself and goes back to West Point of the Air at Randolph, everything changed. Uh, there was a static and stable and important mission that was at Randolph Field permanently and is still there and helped keep Randolph uh, this historic zone of, uh, of great note. There's a guy named Roger Freeman who's got a website. I'm not sure what it's called but he's plotted a lot of the auxiliary fields on his website and has maps of them. He's also the possessor of an operational aerodrome flying World War I aircraft in, where is it, Kingsville? Kingsbury. 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 Oh, wonderful. A, a question on, in terms of Brooks. <laughs> what the relationship of San Antonio in, in terms of NASA and the whole space program, and I know that's the place where Kennedy made his last speech, dedicated, anyways, the story of Brooks and aerospace. Well, we didn't bring our pajamas tonight, but uh, <laughs> I could spend hours. Let me uh, reference uh, a site that you all could go to for free. Uh, I had the great pleasure, I spent 16 years at Brooks and 11 of those years with the scientific community with the Air Force Research Laboratory in the School of Aerospace Medicine, and I produced for the Air Force before Brooks closed the, the documentary, The Story of Brooks. That's on YouTube in eight episodes. It tells the 90-year history of Brooks uh, and about the space program and the contributions of the Air Force to uh, the space program. And it, uh, it really started, of course, with the school of, uh, the first school in the Air Force, the School of Aviation Medicine. Uh, when it, uh, it, when it uh, came back pr from Brooks to, uh, to Randolph Field and, uh, and Dr. Harry Armstrong, who uh, was the uh, second commandant of the School of Aerospace Medicine, he was, by the way, Dr. Armstrong, uh, you've probably not heard that name, but he uh, was credited with developing uh, cabin pressurization for aircraft, but he had a vision in 1949 to, to create the world's first department of space medicine at the School of Aviation Medicine at Randolph. And what he did was he recruited uh, German scientists, engineers from the Luftwaffe under Operation Paperclip, and they came to San Antonio. Half of them uh, were recruited by the Soviet Union, and the other half were recruited by the United States Air Force, and most of them came to San Antonio to Randolph. And uh, they uh, were working this little genesis of the space program, how the Air Force was ahead of everybody. So he created the world's first department of space mess in 1949. And in 1952, the two of the German scientists he brought over were the Hans brothers, uh, I mean the Haber brothers, Fritz and, and Hans Haber, and they uh, developed the world's first uh, spaceship out of a low pressure chamber, which we have at the Airman Heritage Museum. We're gonna be developing that into an exhibit. And they were experimenting with different atmospheres in this little chamber in 1952. So what happens in 1957, October 4th, 1957, the Soviet Union uses their German science engineers to launch Sputnik 1. There were space ages uh, on. So what, what did the United States have? We did not have NASA. The Air Force was conducting all these experiments, mostly here in San Antonio, mostly at Randolph. So uh, the United States was embarrassed and they said, well, we, what can we do to counter what the Soviets did? They turned to the United States Air Force, the Dr. Armstrong's group, and uh, they launched a young man by the name of Airman Donald Farrell, a uh, Lackland Air Force space airman, an accountant from Bronx, New York, 22 years old in the world's first simulated trip to the moon in that chamber that we, uh, I just talked about. And, uh, and he spent seven days, the first human being ever to be sequestered in that chamber uh, on a simulated trip to the moon. He, uh, this is February 19, uh, February 15th, uh, st he started the experiment uh, in, in 1958. And after he uh, finished his experiment, waiting for him as uh, the, the hatch was opened, 100% uh, oxygen, that uh, was Lyndon Johnson. Senator Lyndon Johnson waiting for him. Of course, he was getting a national hero. And what happened was that opened the door. Uh, NASA 
became a NASA later that year, but they had to rely on the Air Force to conduct most of the uh, human, human experiments, the behavioral science experiments. So the contribution of the Air Force continued for the next 30 something years at Brooks in the space program. Yes, uh, thank you for, we have, yeah, we have, yeah, we're right down, we're right down the all here. We had a lot of uh, interesting, interesting things with the, with the, with the primates, yes. <laughs> the, uh, the United States Air Force uh, trained quite a few of, the, of the, the primates for the space program. Actually, the Project Mercury was an Air Force program held, taken over by NASA in 1958. And part of that program was to, uh, to test a couple of things, uh, weightlessness and acceleration and the effects of radiation. Of course, this is all new. They didn't know the effects on human physiology. So what they were doing was they had, had experiment with, with animals. The Russians sent up uh, Laika, the dog, uh, and Sputnik 2. Uh, we, our first uh, launch into space, uh, suborbital flights, were the, uh, a couple of squirrel monkeys, uh, but that, the ones that were really were trained for the space program were at, here, right here in San Antonio and at Holloman. Uh, the, uh, the School of Aerospace Medicine was working with a monkey called SAM, the, the acronym School of Aerospace Medicine, a rhesus monkey, trained uh, and uh, outfitted for a, a flight uh, in 1959. And Dr. Lou Bitter, uh, who's a scientist from the School of Aerospace Medicine, uh, turned to his wife, Edna. By the way, it's in the documentary. And he asked, well, we need to have something to protect this monkey. Uh, we need a monkey suit, or a space suit. And she thought and thought and thought. And she said, I don't know. And it had to be heat resistant, a couple other parameters. And she actually designed the first space monkey suit out of her uh, Hoover ironing board cover. <laughs> and so they fitted that monkey uh, with that, that at Mag makeshift uh, adapted space reuse. adapted reuse. <laughs> it was launched from Wallops Island uh, off the coast of Virginia in September uh, of uh, 1959, suborbital flight. He survived the flight. Uh, he ended up in the San Antonio Zoo, and the rocket that he flew is now at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. And followed that flight was with Miss Sam, Miss Sam Space, which was the female version, and then, of course, the last uh, with the, the chimpanzees, Ham and Enos. They were trained at Holloman Air Force Base. Now, I was with the scientific community for quite a few years, and I actually talked to one of the scientists that worked with Ham and, uh, and Enos at Holloman. And he came to visit Bro Ed Brooks, and I said, one of my questions was, well, what, did the, what were some of your concerns in dealing with these monkeys? And the, the main concern was this, they want to know, they were not, Air Force was not trained in zoology and working with animals. They had to find out some of the, some of the things, the threats to, uh, that were the, to, to the human beings with working with these monkeys. And the main concern was the strength of, of the chimpanzees that they were training for the space program. So what the scientists told me, they actually built a, a chair, a strength chair at Holloman. They put in several uh, adult female, uh, adult uh, uh, chimpanzees in the chair to test their strength. And then they put several uh, airmen volunteers, human male, male volunteers in the chair to check, check, check their strength compared to the monkeys. Now, before I tell you what, what, what they found... I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, could I, I, I don't... It's a fascinating story, but we do have some other questions, and we oh. l have limited time. Yeah, one, more, one more last thing. Okay. One last thing. If you heard about five years ago, you heard about that woman that was, uh, was attacked by the chimpanzee in the, in the apartment, had her face torn off. You all remember that? Had to be reconstructed surgery? Well, it turned out that the monkeys, the chimpanzee is seven times stronger than a human being. So that's... Okay. <laughs> all right. So what, what, yes, sir. What, what's <laughs> Over there, yeah. Yeah, my question is this. We recently, uh, I don't know how recently, but we have two Air Force wings involved in cybersecurity. I'm wondering how that came to be, that they're here, and whatever you can tell us about how large the operations are and, and what they do. And I, I'd like to know if the rumor is true that they were involved in the recent uh, election in Moscow, in, in Russia, <laughs> uh, in, in an effort to elect Putin. Well. And, and again, that, 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 I meant to talk about that. The 24th Air Force is the cyber uh, Air Force uh, operation in, uh, as a numbered Air Force here in San Antonio. And that kind of grew out of uh, the, uh, the central nexus of the, having the intel community here. Uh, the ISR command, the, uh, the overflight command, became the 25th Air Force. And since the 1950s, San Antonio has been a part and parcel of the, the rise of computer technology to support the uh, uh, semi-autonomous ground environment system, SAGE, that became part of our space program, part of our missile complexes, and part of our worldwide uh, early warning system. And uh, the 25th Air Force it was part of the, uh, 
the interpretation of data that was collected from around the world and from our orbital satellites. So uh, San Antonio, since the 50s, has been associated with what became uh, cyber warfare and uh, the, the rise of the computer and is also in part of the, uh, the uh, satellite and uh, reconnaissance apparatus for the international security as well. There are a number of Air Forces assigned, one to Space Command, the 24th Air Force, and the 25th Air Force here in San Antonio is assigned to Air Combat Command. So again, look at the large uh, footprint that we have, and both of those are in Lackland. Lackland has something called Security Hill where 24th and 25th Air Force are located. A uh, huge, huge footprint. Almost everything the Air Force does either started here or continues here. Do we have any more questions? Uh, yes, sir, if we could get you the microphone uh, here in uh, front and then we'll move to the back. Uh, we have one in back as well. This is kind of a follow-up to Rick's question. So when my neighbor mumbles under his breath, I work for the DOD, and he works in a building on another side of town that's not on any military installation that has no windows and a number across the front. Is he in your numbers list and in the money and all that you presented? Because I know a lot of those guys. They well, don't I say what they you, do. I could tell you, but then we have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. Those are figures I got from the uh, Public Affairs Office at Joint Base San Antonio. I see. But, but you think they include all the security that you guys are talking about, too? Probably so. Yeah. Most. Yeah. Well, your question is also a good one. If the 24th and 25th hadn't been here, that NSA complex that's now off of 410 probably wouldn't have been located there. So what you are seeing is that military, military industrial intelligence complex obviously also uh, uh, comes together here in San Antonio as well. In the, in the back, yes, sir. Question for John, the phrase military city USA is now trademarked, I believe, by the city or someone. Do you right. know when that phrase first began to be used as a phrase that was true, of course, for a long time, but do you have any, any indication of the origin of that term? I think I began, you know, I wasn't the first one to use it, but I first applied it to stuff that I was writing about 10 years ago. I, I would say about 2009. Uh, the 502nd Air Base Wing becomes the, the uh, headquarters for a joint base, and a joint base concept, and I think that was part of their unifying, uh, you know, uh, trademark and morale. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Joint Base San Antonio is the largest of the joint bases. And it's about a third of all military spending in Texas, which I found is pretty fascinating. Well, uh, I'm going to go ahead and take the prerogative of the chair to make a comment and to ask the final question before we get out of here. The first comment would be that uh, uh, the father of aerospace medicine was Hubertus Strughold, a very problematic figure uh, based on, he was a German scientist uh, who was complicit potentially in, uh, uh, in experiments done on uh, uh, Jews and political prisoners uh, in uh, Nazi Germany concentration camps. I'm a, historian of the Holocaust, yeah. so I want to make sure I, I put that in there. But my question would be, uh, one adaptive reuse, uh, one of the big issues I think we're facing as a community is Fort Bullis, and I live out in that direction, the ambient light conditions and the encroachment, uh, and that may be literally a real estate area that becomes in the near future untenable for some of the missions uh, that the Army uses it for. So I'd be interested, John, if you have any, uh, talking about a real estate boom for the city, and uh, if you would uh, maybe address that issue. Camp Bullis is, is essential to the military presence in San Antonio because that's where the medical training people go to train. If they can't train out there because of the, the light conditions, because of all the condos around the perimeter, uh, they'll move that school somewhere else. The other elements that are at Fort Sam are all headquarters, and they don't really need Camp Bullets. So if the medical training moves away, everything else can move away. And poof, there goes Military City USA. And with Randolph, uh, I think it was like a frog boiling. Someone said, uh, 
it, uh, shirts in New Braunfels and Universal City, Cibolo, they've all been growing exponentially. And like I said, 100,000 in just the last six years. Everyone wants to be part of Texas and South Texas, and that's great. Problem is that the jewel of the Air Force, Randolph Air Force Base, it would be really ironic and a sad day if we had to close our air mission there. But I think the city's engaged. And uh, one of the things that I can say that has proliferated the discussion of Military City USA is that we are always proactive and always innovative as San Antonians, and I don't expect that this particular issue will be uh, something that we won't defeat either. It's, uh, you know, when you look at the way we, we purchased the land that became Randolph, this is easy. Okay, well, on that note, it's easy. Uh, thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you to our... Can I one more time? Here in San Antonio, we've got two museums at Fort Sam Houston that are open to the public. And we have an Air Force, at least one Air Force museum in Lackland. Right, and a Security Forces Annex that's part of that museum. So there's yeah. two buildings. You can get on the military bases. They don't ask for your social security number anymore. Just your name, driver's license number, and birthday. And that's enough to find out if you're a criminal. And if you want to visit the post, don't go during rush hour. You know, in the morning when all the contractors start coming in, go a little bit later. And if you have a warrant or a want by the police on anywhere in your past, don't try to get through because they will arrest you right there. And if you want a 15-minute tour, uh, carve out two hours of your day, and Rudy will be there. <laughs>